Now, the power utility ESCOM has announced that its controversy-laden Madupi power plant has now been completed. It has, plagued, it has been plagued rather by a series of cost overruns, design issues, as well as numerous controversies. Joining us to discuss what this completion means for a grid system characterized by load shedding are energy experts Liz McDade and Mr. Tabiso Tenyane. Very good afternoon uh, to both of you and thank you for your time today. We, we spoke a little bit earlier on, uh, right here on Newsroom Africa Channel 405, to an energy expert, um, Chris Yelland, who said the completion of Madipu power plant is actually not 100%. Let me ask you, uh, Ms. McDade, just to comment on that. What is the exact situation? ESCOM saying Madupi power plant is done, ready to be uh, to go commercial. Uh, so my understanding is that we are sitting with a with a plant that's delivering energy. But remember that one of the key issues around Madupi was the need to address air pollution um, and the gas, uh, sulfur gas desulfurization uh, aspect, the technical side, and. Uh, so if we don't have that, then what we are doing is adding to the pollution and the health burden of the people around that power station. And uh, so my understanding is there's still a problem with Madupi. And as far as its power generation capability and capacity, is that a check in that department? I, I believe so. I, I believe so. But, uh, you know, with Madupi, we seem to have uh, never been on a straight path. So it's good to have uh, an announcement, but um, let's uh, hope the lights stay on. Mm. And, and Mr. Tenyane, just your reaction to this particular announcement. Um, <clears throat> you know, Tammy, uh, let's put a context here. The, what it means, you know, when you are commissioning a power plant, you start with the six units of Midupi, 800 megawatt each. So what it means by completion now is the unit one, because you start vice versa. So we started with commissioning unit six, unit five, unit four, unit three, then two. Now the last one that is coming in, and I'm not sure why is it creating an in a, and an excitement because that's just an 800 megawatt. But my colleague here has just nailed this thing. There is a technology which you capture the carbon dioxide from as you are burning the coal, right? And, and that technology, unfortunately, due to lack of funds, because the original cost of Midupi was 80 billion, it ended up being probably three times the amount which is now sitting around 240 billion or so. Now, there is what we also called an IDC, interest during construction. Midupi was supposed to be com uh, commissioned and finalized in 2015. We're now sitting six years later. The cost overruns and the interest thereof cumulatively, you can understand that particular impact. And where does that cost go to? the consumers, because we need to then calculate the total 240 billion into a tariff now, in order then to say, now is it going to be performing like this? But we also know that the engineering design of Midupi has never been very successful. As a result, it will never perform to its maximum expectation in terms of performance. The capacity of Midupi is is 4,800 megawatt. And, and therefore then we are definitely sure that the 800 that is adding does not necessarily negate the challenge that ESCOM is having. Ms. McDade, why has it taken so long for this project to reach completion? Sure. I think that... <laughs> <laughs> My colleague can respond to that. <laughs> I think we can both respond. Let, let, let's uh, start, let's start with you, Ms. McDade. <laughs> Sorry. So, Tommy, I think um, it's been plagued with allegations, and I think some proven now, um, of, of uh, 
um, where the different parts of it came from, the delays in construction, there were issues on the plant level, there were issues with uh, workers. Um, there was, it, it just seems to have been, as with many large projects, just mired in controversy and problems. And I think this is a lesson for the, for the future. This should be the last big power station built. We, we, we should now move yeah. to smaller distributed generation. Uh, Tavisa, you agree with me? Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. And, but I don't want to be technical, Tammy, but I would want to give a high level which has caused us to have this particular problem. Mm. There is two ways in engineering where when you want to build a power plant, you either follow what we call an EPC, which EPC means engineering procurement construction. Therefore, then you're saying, I want to build this house and I want to find somebody that can build it for me fully for the 80 billion that I have. And then the second one is EPCM. You manage the construction yourself and which is what ESCOM opted to do here to say we are going to manage these two power stations that are big as a size, which they have never built it before. And they said, we are going to be doing it. So what it means therefore then is, you are then saying, I am going to be buying and ordering the parts of this. And I will then tell you the builder when all parts are now here and therefore then you need to put it together. Now, if you miss the strong management, the EPCM, which is Engineering Procurement Construction Management, is successfully done by China because China builds 10 of these things a year. So therefore, then they know how to manage that in a proper way. But if you have not done it before, you can't say, I want to manage my own house. You're going to make the mistakes. And the skill sets that build the power stations in ESCOM the last one probably was built in 1983 or something. So they were gone. Mm. And, 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 and you made a, you made a <laughs> comment there, uh, Ms. McDade, saying that you hope that this will be the last uh, huge power plant procurement by ESCOM. We know yes. that the road has now been paved for independent power producers. How do you uh, see that particular relationship faring um, and, and who is really going to be doing, um, I guess, the management and the oversight of those uh, particular energy mixes? Ms. McDade? Well, I think, firstly, we, we have now built some experience in building uh, small plants. We have that renewable experience. We are also looking at a different um, uh, scenario to, to, to Madupi, because this is a case where you might have a mine which says, I'm going to put up this power plant it's not going to, it's, it's used to managing a business environment. It's not going to let it run for nothing. Um, I think what, what at the moment the problem is that uh, Minister Mantash was given 60 days from the 10th of June to do his homework. And we are now sitting less than a week to go um, or maybe one week to go. Uh, and we are still not seeing anything. So is he going to make the deadline or is this going to be further delays in renewable energy build? Um, well, it might not even be renewable energy for all of these, but the bottom line is the further we delay, the more the lights are likely to go out. And what should we be expecting as far as the mixed energy bag, Mr. Tenyani? What would be uh, the most efficient strategy for South Africa? Look, South Africa is very fortunate. We have the sun in the Northern Cape and Northwest, mm -hmm. uh, Limpopo, um, and the radiation is very good. What we need to do is to make sure that ESCOM is going to strengthen their transmission in the, in the Northern Cape because they just announced that they are now saturated. Um, and we have the wind in the Western Cape and the Eastern Cape. Uh, we can then bring in the wind turbines there and and be able to even cover uh, desalination. Um, and, and we have uh, the two ports that I think, or three, Saldana Kuha and Richards Bay from a gas perspective, because I think we need to do that to balance the mix because uh, wind is erratic and solar is probably nine o'clock to half past four or five o'clock. 
So you need to balance something in regard to base load and which the just transition from a South African perspective is going to probably even add biomass if we are to be finding enough land, which we also fortunate enough in South Africa that we have that. But on a longer term basis, we also have rich uranium and we have seawater. So we can even go to nuclear uh, in a much more managed way, as my colleague is saying, that we did not have to build a 9,600 of nuclear. But if you build a 1,000 uh, megawatt of nuclear, that's the right way to go, so that then you are balancing and making sure the transmission has enough initial. I think the just transition won't need any more nuclear, as you know, uh, that I wouldn't agree with. Um, and and uh, but, but I do agree with you that we have this enormous solar resource, enormous wind resource, and we're also seeing things like hydrogen, a lot of talk about hydrogen as a as a future fuel and storage. I think there's a lot of discussion about storage and the and the price of storage at the moment in terms of. So I I I think that partly what we need is a government department that's a bit more nimble on its feet. It's very lumbering, and and by using the factors that we've been talking about, you can easily every year produce a plan that's adjusted to ensure that we go the right way and we don't get locked into things that we're going to regret 10 years down the line. And, and I think that's Madupi as a salutary lesson of how not to do things. And let's hope that uh, the government is listening. I'd, I'd like to touch on, uh, Ms. McDade, on something that you said earlier on. Uh, and I'm going to ask you, Mr. Tenyan, if you could comment on this. We spoke about the uh, completeness of uh, Madupi Power Plant. Ms. McDade said, well, it's completed really as far as the amount of energy that it's supposed to emit, but the issue of carbon emissions has not been addressed. Mr. Tenyane, how is this going to affect us in the future? We do know that now that uh, Madupi is complete, it's supposed to have a lifespan of another 50 years. How is this particular issue of carbon emission going to be addressed if it hasn't been addressed now and at this phase of the uh, completion and construction process is this something that can still be done or should it have been uh, included in the earlier stages of the construction yeah i think the the, the first priority that i could say that uh, andre de Reda has tried is to reduce the debt um, and be able to have a balance sheet that can can give us uh, enough money because I think that GDF technology, FDG, I think, FGD, yeah, FGD yeah. technology is going to cost probably in the 20 billion or so. Um, it's quite an inexpensive technology. So, so definitely he wants to address that because Midupi has its long life. And if he doesn't address that, he's going to go against the new laws of the cleaner quality, air quality standards. And more so that you you know for the fact that the country has already uh, pronounced the policy of a net zero when it comes to emissions. So with this coming without the FGD uh, technology and that's going to flood again is just uh, a step backward for the country. And 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 let's let's remind ourselves that and, and I want to support it. Let's remind ourselves that this was a decision taken 2007, mm -hmm. right? And intention was it must complete around 2015, 2017, uh, which it never necessarily happened. And nobody had then anticipated that the cost would be eroded this much to a point that you cannot also fulfill certain things. Unfortunately, those laws are here. And if you cannot retrofit, he must then shut down those other power stations and be able then to go with other technologies. How fast we can go, even the self-generation that uh, my colleague was talking about, the 100 megawatt of self-generation. Um, the president, Cyril, pronounced two years ago, the department never did anything in relation to changing the regulations. Mm -hmm. He ended up announcing it and now forcing it to happen. So we really sitting with load shedding, which is a problem of 2007. 14 years later, we haven't necessarily addressed it. We hope that this time around, someone would be able to be very decisive. If not, the president needs to take a leadership in making sure that 
whoever is expected to perform must perform. Let me, let me wrap up with this uh, one question, and let me start with you, Mr. McDade. We heard Deputy uh, Minister in, in, in Finance, uh, David Masondo, uh, saying on Friday that there are talks of possibly listing ESCOM on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. Your reactions to that? <laughs> well, I'm not sure how that's going to work, actually, because the road ahead is for ESCOM to, bra to, to split itself into three oh. different countries. So which one mm -hmm. are they going to list? And, and given its debt situation, this seems to be a somewhat premature idea. Uh, but yeah, I'm not a finance expert, but I wouldn't be buying shares in ESCOM right now. <laughs> and uh, Mr. Tenyani, your thoughts on that move? Um, we hope that comes out of the total restructuring strategy and they have then decided to allocate this debt because the debt must be allocated somewhere. It's still a liability that needs to be addressed. But we, we are grateful to hear ideas being uh, tested and the market will respond to that. But also, Tammy, just to end it, South Africa must pay for the services of the electricity we are getting. South Africans owes ESCOM 40 billion. And, and, and that I, I don't understand. If you are, you are any retail, you are selling something, but people are not paying for it, but they still want to have it. it it's a conundrum that the country must decide upon. It's an, an appeal that I think we need to all take. It's very serious. And we will end our conversation on that appeal this afternoon. I thank you both very much for your time and your insight in these energy related issues. That's uh, Ms. Liz McDade. She's uh, out as parliamentary and energy advisor, as well as Mr. Tabiso uh, Denyai, an energy expert.